Happy Halloween, everybody. Today, I'm going to be reading my synopsis for my NaNoWriMo project. If you have missed any of my previous videos or um, blog posts about the topic, I'm going to be handwriting NaNoWriMo for the very first time this year, and I'm really, really excited about getting back to my roots. I'm going to be starting it in this um, wonderful um, Peter Popper notebook. I do have a recent video about a notebook tour, and if I run out of room in this notebook, I'll just like move on to some of the other um, wonderful, beautiful um, Peter Popper notebooks. And that's also going to be a really fun, exciting first for me, because like since I began, I'm working on um, Cinnamon, my magnum opus, which has been like, you know, 99% handwritten since I began it on the 3rd of October, 1993. I be can't believe it's been, you know, 30 years already. I only like used one notebook for each part of the book. And so like, particularly in the earlier days when I was still like, you know, developing into myself as a writer and becoming like a more mature adult. I obviously was a teenager back in the day. I once, you know, when I ran out of like pages in the notebook, I would just move on to the next, even if sometimes that meant like kind of finishing in media Reese. And so like I now, now I realize like maybe the story you want to tell for this particular part of the book, yes, yeah, sometimes it can just be like told like completely in a, maybe like a month or so, or just like a like 50 pages or so hand written then like naturally it blends into the you know the next um part of the book but sometimes you're like you know still going like for example maybe you want to depict a certain event in people's lives and like it's still going on you haven't reached its conclusion properly or you don't want to like waste or like speed along character development or the plot development just because you're running out of room in the notebook so just, I really really well I don't understand why I never did this before I'm sorry this video is completely unscripted so that's going to be really you know fun because I do feel like this story is going to be taking a place over like you know nine months or so so th that really might take up more um, room than just one notebook pr notebook particularly because you know it has an ensemble cast and so many different things going on in the storyline and I also do have a future um video planned about a pen tour so I'm look forward to that most of those are um fountain pens and this is also a wonderful fountain pen and I also have some really really cool um roller balls so look forward to that if you absolutely love um pen stuff and now um here is the synopsis and it is called um rising from the rubble if I had to guess because I am you know writing a little bit out of order so like I was I'm let currently in um, 1998 in cinnamon and then I skipped ahead to September 2001 for my um July project so basically you know obviously there's like you know three years between like what I like officially got up to versus what I have you know skipped ahead to and so I don't really know the numbered on um, part of the books but I do know there will be an even 60 in the the beginning of the book from the 1941 Pearl Harbor Day until the dawn of the new millennium in the year 2000 so it, it I would if I had to guess maybe like part 63 or 60 five-ish and it is um set from the 12th of September 2001 to tentatively but this probably will be the the concrete um, finishing date on um, the 25th of June um, 2002. So this is, you know, very late um, contemporary historical fiction. And obviously, like you can tell from the starting date, it's on the, you know, the aftermath of 9-11. And I am aware some people, they feel that's one of the, you know, historical events along with the Holocaust and a few other things. So they feel, oh, you should never write historical fiction about that. It's gross and, you know, disrespectful and stuff like that. Oh, you should only do real life memoirs. But, you know, Guess what? One of the hallmarks of historical fiction is putting fictional characters in real life, you know, events and situations. It's not, you know, no, nothing should be off limits as long as you're like handling the material respectfully and being you know, historically inaccurate and not like going all over the place with like things that absolutely never happened in real life. And I do have a, a, a blog post from like a, a few months ago about, you know, writing historical fiction about 9-11, some things to keep in mind. And I am planning to do a future um, video about that, but obviously no disrespect at all is intended. And obviously because the book spans until the year um, 2050, that was obviously going to be part of the book at some point. You can't like really get around that at all. And so anyway, here is the um, synopsis from Rising from the Rubble. How do you rebuild your life and regain a sense of normalcy and safety after surviving or witnessing a terrorist attack? Mansika Amiel and the Bronx instinctively hightailed it out of Manhattan and found refuge in the Poconos, and were presently joined by H.G., Devorah, and their young daughters fleeing from Washington, D.C. Their new community, which is still very much a work in progress, is part kibbutz, part resort, part self-sustained commune, and part summer camp that's affordable for the common people. Soon after arriving, Wilhelm places ads in New York City metropolitan area newspapers soliciting other survivors and people otherwise personally affected. Like, for example, they weren't actually there, but they lost a loved one or one of their you know, like family members or friends was working there and was a survivor 
themselves. And so he's putting all these ads for anyone like survivors and otherwise personally affected to come to this haven in the Poconos for both the fast approaching high holy days and general recovery. People are welcome to stay as long or as short as they like, though the original group of refugees have already begun putting down roots and created a progressive school for the children, a vibrant small synagogue, and many active clubs. Sapphire Sanctuary, as their new home comes to be known, the sapphires because that's one of the main birthstones of the month of September, represents an island of safety in a wounded world. It's also far from the foul smell, toxic air, and heartbreaking hole in the skyline still holding cruel court in the city they fled. Unfortunately, not all survivors have the option of packing their bags and leaving town until it's safe to return. Razel, who is only 18 years old, who is carried down from the 91st floor of the North Tower by two young firemen and exited the building with seconds to spare as it was like literally starting to collapse above them, is stuck in NYU downtown hospital. She was pinned under a heavy desk for almost an hour which severely shattered both of her legs and required surgery to put in external fixators. I've had an external fixator in my right leg. That is just like really, really not a fun experience at all. Razel's other injuries include a few broken ribs, some smoke inhalation, and a head injury, which caused her to temporarily lose consciousness, required stitches, and also caused some bleeding, and triggered a migraine disorder. And she also had some debris that like came into her eyes as she was being carried out, and it uh, temporarily um, obscured her vision, but that doesn't really have left any like, major injuries. Razel isn't very happy about being stuck in hospital for the high holy days and having to indefinitely postpone her return to NYU. It was her first year there but she unhappily accepts that there's no alternative to the situation. She uses her hospital stay to draw and paint like never before, turning her memories of the attack and images from the constant news coverage, which she didn't personally witness or experience, into the most personal artwork she has ever done. When she's finally discharged in time for Halloween, her family takes her to Sapphire Sanctuary so she can be among other survivors and obviously going back to New York from time to time for follow-up with her doctors. One of those survivors is another young artist, also painting and drawing his experiences. Before long, he and Razel are in love, and I haven't quite um, decided on a name for him yet. I thought maybe Daniel at first, but then I remembered uh, one of um, Cinnamon's granddaughters, Claudia, is going to marry a man named Daniel, so you don't want too many characters with the same name, like particularly if they're like roughly from the same generation and interacting with one another. So, you know, back to the drawing board for that one. Monsika and Amiel who were unusually intimate best friends for seven years, like, you know, so close many people were constantly mistaking them for boyfriend and girlfriend. They insisted, no, we're just like super close best friends who happen to be like of the opposite sex. So they took their relationship to the natural next step by becoming lovers the night they arrived at Sapphire Sanctuary. This was near the very end of the previous part on um, Charlotte's Most Terrifying Prophecy, which was my um, July Camp Nano project. Their new union is made even closer and more perfect when they discover there's a baby on the way. Conceived on that emotional first night, Monsika is going to make her pregnancy announcement on Halloween when she discovers she's pregnant, and that's the same day Amiel is going to propose to her. Plans are made for a spring wedding. During the winter, Agnieszka, Tony, and Reina come to visit from Israel with their families and decide to stay indefinitely as well. Agnieszka is um, Monsika's older sister, and Tony is... Um, one of their cousins, and um, Reina is um, a cousin of Tony's um, husband, Natan, who goes by Nate. The second intifada is reaching its deadliest height, and they don't feel safe returning home with so many suicide bombings, disrupting normal life, and destroying their sense of safety. At Sapphire Sanctuary, they don't have to be on constant high alert every time they walk down the street, get on a bus, go shopping, or go to a restaurant. But despite all the happiness and healing to be found in Sapphire Sanctuary, life isn't entirely perfect. Monsika has been left with overpowering PTSD from the sights, sounds, smells, experiences, and primal f feeling of fear she can never forget or share with people who weren't there. And her lungs are compromised from the toxic air she spent hours breathing in. And she and Amiel were also um, second year graduate students at NYU and they have decided to indefinitely like, defer returning to school because you know they just can't handle going back to New York City immediately like just you know obviously the smell and the terrible memories and they just you know, want some time to you know, like physically recuperate so they're basically you know, like taking a sabbatical from grad school. 
Monsika also hasn't heard anything about her roommate, um, Courtney, who became a good friend despite them, like, you know, being kind of enemies at first when they were, you know, undergraduate roommates at Columbia, and they were, like, total opposites. They just kind of hated one another's guts, but then they uh, eventually started becoming, like, genuine friends and realized they had some things in common after all, and so... Courtney worked on the 105th floor of the North Tower. She was an in, in, in intern with um, Cantor Fitzgerald, and they frequently ate breakfast together at um, Windows on the World in the morning. And then, you know, that's where they, the Charlotte's most terrifying prophecy began. And then uh, Courtney went off to her um, internship, and Monsika went down to the concourse level at the mall. Monsika wants to believe Courtney noticed her precious cell phone missing and was on her way home to retrieve it when the plane hit, possibly in one of the sky lobbies below the impact zone. But when months pass without a single word, that hope starts dimming. The recovery of Courtney's purse from the rubble seems to indicate the obvious, but Monsika knows from her own family history and the Brant's family history that sometimes people can be falsely presumed dead and then resurface years later for a happy reunion. Monsika's greatest triumph over the forces of evil who tried to kill her is the birth of her first child a few months before her wedding in Devorah, who is um, one of the, the Bronze as well. She's um, married to um, Cinnamon's um, youngest nephew, um, H.G. Um, Holden Gregory Filliard II. Uh, so Devorah and H.G. have their um, fifth child born during the time, and it's um, yet another girl named Yaffa. The baby naming ceremony for Amansika and Amiel's baby uh, on the eighth day of life surreptitiously coincides with the inauguration of a new Torah scroll commissioned by the residents of Sapphire Sanctuary, a Torah dedicated to the memories of those who perished. She and Amiel named their daughter Rana, which means light in Pashto. When they were leaving the Afghan restaurant, they had dinner at in Jersey City on that dark day in September and where they were like warmly welcomed and the, their host told them, we're not going to charge you for anything, we're just going to give you it for free because of the horrible thing you just experienced across the river and they also gave them lots of you know leftovers to take with them and recipes for the things that would you like be destroyed on the road like for example the ice cream would melt or some things just you know couldn't stay fresh and so the family in charge gave them blessings including toro tiaro passe rana razi after darkness there is light which i'm also going to be writing at the beginning of the notebook in on Pasho, I've been like practicing the characters a little bit. I'm really not familiar at all with like writing Arabic alphabet, so hopefully I won't, you know, like get it like too um, messy. Rana's birth and name symbolize the new life they have built for themselves after rising from the rubble. So um, please leave me a comment to let me know if you're working on Nano or like a brief synopsis of your project, you know, like how many times you have done Nano in the past. Maybe this is your first time or you're an old had old timer like I am if you've ever handwritten Nano or if you're looking forward to my um pen tour video or just like what you thought of my synopsis in general or if you would like me to do a future video about like things to keep in mind when writing historical fiction about 9-11 or the aftermath or maybe just like have you written any con late con very late contemporary historical fiction or read any or just like what you think of that like subgenre in general so thanks again for watching oh happy Halloween by the way I'm wearing my cute um fun like black um had plugs in my ears. My ears are currently I'm stretched to half an inch. And thanks again for watching. I will see you very soon. I'm happy Nano and happy Halloween. Bye.